Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Walter Dial, who is tax partner at GRF CPAs and Advisors here in Bethesda, Maryland. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building sellable business value or, or transferable business value, and then planning for your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that is sellable, and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. If you have a business that's not <clears throat> a lifestyle business, a business that you want to get value out of eventually for retirement or any other purpose, and or you want to have as many options for exit as possible in the future, you're going to need to build a business uh, in a way that it is sellable or transferable. And that involves key value drivers like strong financial performance, of course, uh, a next level management team, the business doesn't run completely around you, um, products and services that are differentiated from your competition, a plan for growth, um, and, uh, among other value drivers, and a strategy that you can and should employ to rightly incentivize your employees who are going to make that growth and profitability happen um, is, um, is incentive planning. How are you going to incent your, your employees to make that growth, growth happen? As, as an owner, you'll want to make sure that the goals that you have for exit and for growth are aligned with the, the, uh, the goals you have for your employees. And then you're gonna to wanna to incentivize them in the right way or appropriately to attain those goals. In our episode number 67 or 63, we discussed an incentive plan called Phantom Stock Plans uh, with attorney Paolo Pesicolin. And today Walter is going to help us understand an, an, another incentive plan, an um, incentive-based compensation plan referred to as profits interest. So Walter, let's get started where we should get started uh, with what is a profit interest incentive-based plan? So Pat, a, a profit interest incentive plan is where the company grants a new partner coming in perhaps or an employee an interest in the future profits of the company. So let's say a company <clears throat> generates $100,000 in profits. If they've given someone a 10% interest in those profits, that person is going to be entitled to 10% of the profits. All right, got it. Now, my understanding, Walter, is that the employee either has to be a partner or is going to be a partner. In, in order to, to be granted profits interest. Yeah, now we're going to talk about, um, I think as we get into it, we'll talk about the taxability issue, and that's where the rules about becoming a partner really come into play. But yeah, but yes, you are correct. Okay, so <clears throat> what does, um, or how does, how does profits interest differ from other stock options? And, and uh, is this, would, would this be categorized as an equity-based or a cash-based uh, incentive plan? So the big difference is this is strictly a profits, you know, as the name implies, it's a profits interest. So if you exercise a stock option, you own a percentage of that company. So if the company's worth a million bucks, you own whatever your, whatever your share percentage is of that million. With a profits interest, you you don't own any of the capital value of the company. All you have is a profits interest. So that's a big, you know, that's obviously a big difference. Um, the other difference, one of the other differences between stock options and the profits interest is with the stock option, you know, the employee at some point has to exercise the option. And that usually involves paying something. Um, it can either, you know, the payment could either be based on fair market value or some, you know, smaller amount. But there is a payment and an exercise with the profits interest. You don't have any of that. And then again, I think, you know, we're going to talk about the tax ramifications a little bit later, but there are some 
significant tax differences between granting a profits interest and someone exercising a stock option. Okay, what about, Brad, you know, a lot of the, the um, clients that you and I have and, and work together have profit sharing plans in place. How would a profits interest plan differ from a profit sharing plan? So a profit, a profit sharing plan is a qualified plan, meaning it, you know, it, it comes under a specific IRS code. There's lots of Department of Labor rules. Uh, you can't discriminate, you know, who participates, all, the, all that type of stuff. You're, um, you know, there's set formulas for the amount of contribution. With this plan, it's, it's not a qualified plan. So you can offer it to anybody you want and you can tweak it any way you would like. So a lot right. more flexibility. So, you know, you're not you're not restricted in the sense that you cannot um, you can choose certain classes of well we we just mentioned it has to be either a partner or or someone who's going to be a partner in order to qualify. So you can discriminate if you will. Whereas with profit sharing, um, because it's um, so highly regulated and it's a qualified retirement plan, right. you cannot discriminate. That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. So then, what is the difference between? I, I I think most of our listeners have are familiar with vested and unvested, and it, it, as it pertains to something like a, a profit sharing plan or a four hundred one k plan, how does that is it is it any different here, vested and unvested, with profits interest than it would be with what they're used to with a four hundred one k or or another plan? I mean, you know, theoretically, vesting is vesting, so it, it's not different. But with qualified plans, there are you have very few options on what is allowed as far as a vesting schedule, and it's always based on uh, years of employment. So, <clears throat> with a profits interest, again, since it's not a qualified plan, you can vest it in you know lots of different ways. So you could say, hey, it's you know in, in two years you're fully vested. But you could also tie it to financial incentives and have someone not vested until that point. So, um, again, you just have more flexibility. But it, but the difference between a vested interest and a, an unvested interest is the same as it is in any context. In the vested interest, you'd be entitled to your profit interest right off the bat. If it's a, I'm sorry, if it's a vested interest, you're going to you know wait for that vesting schedule to kick in your profits interest. If it's unvested, you're going to have an immediate benefit. All right, good. Okay, so now let's do talk about the taxation of, okay. of profit centers. Yeah, and I think this is where this is probably the big advantage of the profit interest incentive plan is that if it's properly structured, the recipient does not recognize any income. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is that the partnership doesn't have any type of offsetting deduction. But you know, one of the big hindrances to bringing in an owner is that there can sometimes be pretty severe tax consequences to it. Because in most instance, instances, you're giving the person a percentage of the value of the company. And if, if that benefit is vested, that's taxable income right off the bat. And you know, companies don't like that for a number, number of reasons. One is the recipients, He's not receiving cash, he's receiving an interest. So he's got to come up with the cash to pay the tax on that. Sometimes, and you know, we've seen situate, we've worked with situations like this where um, some type of equity grant is accompanied by a cash bonus so that the recipient can pay their taxes. So that costs the company money. The other complication is you have to value the company. And these closely held companies, you know, that can be expensive. And the IRS could argue with you. So the profits interest avoids all that and just makes it a lot easier. No tax ramifications on either side. You don't need to worry about valuation. Um, so it's a lot cleaner, which I think is really the number one reason why people really like it. Even if you have a, a stock option plan, when, those, when you exercise your options, you're going to pay tax on the difference between the exercise price and the value of the company at that date. So again, you've got a valuation issue and you potentially have a cash flow issue. Yeah, so 
Okay. <clears throat> when do the when does the recipient actually receive the pro profit's interest? They receive it, you know, based on what the plan says. So they could receive it immediately. Or it, it and the plan could be drawn up any any way the owner wants it to be drawn up. In in regard to, you know, maybe there it it, it could be an annual distribution or only at a liquidation event, anything like that? Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's, a, it's an interesting point because what the, what the recipient is granted is an interest in the profits. So they're not guaranteed a cash distribution. So, you know, worst case scenario, they're going to receive a K-1 with, let's say, $100,000 of income. They're going to owe tax on that. So... From the recipient standpoint, they want to make sure that there's something in that partnership agreement that says they're going to at least receive a distribution to cover their taxes. But you are correct in the sense that, you know, the partnership can set it up however they want. There is no requirement when you give someone a profits interest to also distribute cash to them. But, you know, obviously the idea is not to penalize people. So you're going to have something in your agreement that's going to address that. Okay, so in, in each year, though, the, the recipient is going to get the K-1 for that particular tax year for their yes. interest in the profits. Yes. And they're going to owe taxes on that interest. Yes. Even if they haven't received it? <laughs> right. That's, you know, that's true for all partnerships, uh -huh. um, S-corporations too, for that matter. You know, any, any flow through the owners of the company are taxed on their share of the profit, regardless of how much gets distributed. So that's where you, you know, where you see problems is where you have a minority shareholder who, for whatever reason, has fallen out of favor with the, with the majority. And the majority could, you know, they could say, you know what, we're not doing any distributions this year. So they could pay themselves like a bonus, a cash bonus, to get the money they need, but then say, hey, we're not gonna do any type of distribution, um, which would hurt the minority shareholders. That's where you see that mostly, but yeah, I mean, there is, there's a risk if you can't trust the people you're in business with, for sure. Yeah, and it, and it would stand to reason that your business structure would have to be a pass-through, is that right for this to? Yeah, this is strictly a partnership or LLC matter. You can't do it with an S-Corp. Uh, it's strictly a partnership or LLC plan. All right, got it. And so let's talk a little bit about who who this would work for, who might, uh, what type of LLC or partnership, what are some other considerations that that they should have in mind when when deciding whether or not a profit's interest is going to be the best, best strategy for them? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, it, it's it's interesting. And you you mentioned that, uh, a few podcasts ago, uh, we talked about phantom stock and that's, you know, phantom stock is, is all is kind of like the profits interest, but for an S corp, it's not quite exactly like that, but it's similar. Um, well, it's based, and it's based on the value of the firm too. Uh, right. You do get, you do get a kicker for the value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even with the profits interest, you could get a kicker for the increase in value. Um, but you know, this would be good really for any firm that, well, the reason I brought up the FAM stock plan is because one of the advantages of the phantom stock is that the recipient is not legally a shareholder. So you don't have the problems associated with having a, a minority shareholder. They have no rights. <clears throat> mm -hmm. With the profits interest incentive plan, the person does become a partner. So Fortunately, you know, partnerships are very flexible. And when I say partnership, I mean, you know, partnership LLC, they're pretty much interchangeable. So the partnership agreement can address exactly what rights partners have. So you need to make sure your agreement is allowing the person who's receiving the profits interest to only have the rights that you want them to have. Because if you don't address it, they're going to have the rights any partner would have. So they'll have rights to vote. They'll have rights to inspect the books, all that stuff. But all those rights can be restricted um, in the partnership agreement. 
the other thing to keep in mind, and this would really be from the recipient's uh, standpoint, you know, if he's a, a regular employee of the LLC and now all of a sudden he's going to get a profits interest. And as we've discussed, in order for that not to be taxable, there's got to be a few things in place. One is he has to be a partner or, or become a partner. Um, the interest can't be tied to like to a real predictable cash flow. In other words, if what you're receiving can really be quantified, the IRS is going to tax it. So if you're becoming a partner in, let's say, a real estate deal, that's like a net lease property. So you know exactly what you're getting. That, that, would ca that could cause it to be taxable. The uh, recipient also has to agree that they're not going to dispose of their interest within two years. Uh, and it can't be part of a, a tiered partnership setup that involves a publicly traded partnership. So there are some rules. But assuming you meet all those, it's going to be tax-free, which is great. But the one thing that the recipient needs to be aware of is he's now no longer an employee. So once you're a partner or a, once you're a partner in a partnership or a member of an LLC, you can no longer receive W-2 compensation. You're either going to receive a guaranteed payment or you're going to receive distributions from the entity. So what that means is you're not going to have withholding anymore. So all of a sudden you're a partner you have no withholding, so you need to make estimated tax payments. If the partnership operates in more than one state, you're now going to have a potential tax liability in, multi, in multiple states. And since you're no longer an employee, you're responsible for paying both halves of Social Security. So, you know, for an employee, the employer pays 7.65% and the employee has withheld 7.65% for Social Security and Medicare. Once you're a partner, you're paying all that yourself. So, you know, someone who's going to receive this, it sounds great. And, it, you know, if, as long as everybody knows what the implications are, it, it's, it's definitely a good thing. But they need to be aware that their life is going to get more complicated. On the positive side, as a partner, if they have unreimbursed business, unreimbursed business expenses, which are, you know, not deductible as an employee, they are deductible for a partner. So they may have cell phone or unreimbursed travel or you know, ho home office, stuff like that, that all of a sudden becomes deductible. And depending on the type of partnership and the amount of profit it generates, they could even qualify for the, what's called the qualified business income deduction, which basically lets you take 20% of the profit right off the top before you subject it to tax. So you know, all in all, their life is going to get more complicated. Um, they could end up owing more tax or less tax, depending on all those, all those little, um, you know, special rules. Yeah, so, so um, clearly, everyone needs to be clear on all the implications and ramifications, particularly from a tax perspective, but also to your point about the recipient's life is going to change. It's going to become more complicated. There's going to be more moving parts that they're going to have to stay, stay on top of. Yeah. Um, again, thinking about who this could work for, it, a scenario I'm thinking of is like a professional firm or or any business who who has partners. Let's say they have five partners now. And they were, they're thinking about future growth. They're thinking about future exit. And, uh, and these five partners, the current five partners, they're equity partners. They don't want to give up any more. They don't want to give up equity in, in what they built to that point. Right. Uh, they, they're willing to give up profit going forward and maybe even some, a percentage of the value going forward of the business as it grows but they're not willing to, to dilute their current equity stake to this point in the business. Yeah. Um, would you that's, say that that's, that's a right scenario? Yeah, that's the perfect scenario. And the other, the other thing that comes into play in that is, you, know, you still see it with the, with the big law firms to an extent where they kind of overcome that problem by <laughs> partners buying in when they become a partner. But you know, for most of the clients we work with, 
the the person that they want to give a profit's interest to, you know, they're not interested. They're not probably don't have the financial means or aren't or are not interested in ponying up a bunch of cash to own a portion of what's already been built. They're perfectly happy with getting their profits interest and potentially sharing in future appreciation. Um, so yeah, I agree 100% with that. Yeah, because the profits would include, would it not, if um, if I'm a recipient as of today, and 10 years from now we sell the firm, then I get a percentage of the profit from from the transaction. Right, and that'll usually usually the agreement is set up that your share is going to be measured as the increase from the day you bought in, or or we're, we're given your interest. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And I think you know the key point is, and you kind of highlighted it at the beginning of the podcast is, you know, these are incentive plans, meaning you're trying to incentivize people to do the things that make your business more valuable and more sellable. And at the end of the day, you know, it's a win-win for everybody because as the profits increase, the recipient of the profits interest, they see more money. As profits increase, the business value increases. And usually if profits are increasing, it means you're doing all the right things from an operational standpoint and a system standpoint. So, you know, I, I think a lot of the clients we work with, they're hesitant to put in these plans, I think because they, you know, they see them as being complicated and maybe expensive as far as, you know, all of a sudden they got to share their profits. But what they're, I think what they're being a little bit short-sighted on and missing out is that, but it's an incentive plan, meaning what you're giving them is really just a percentage of future, of an increase. So potentially it's making you money, not costing you money, but sometimes it's hard to, hard for someone to see that. Yeah, could the could the reward uh, or the award of profit interest be tied to? Well, it is. It's tied to profit increase, of course. But yeah. but could a, could the current partnership say to the the new the new recipient who is going to be a partner? Look, I don't. I, I think I know the answer to this question, but, but let me ask it anyway. We're going to award this to you if you meet these metrics in regard to your role and performance. We will award you this um, profit interest if you hit these metrics. Is, is that possible? And in, 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 can that be structured in this situation? It, it doesn't seem so because- Yeah, you, that, that really can't be, but their profits interest does not have to be 10% of profit, you know, it could be a percentage of the increase in your department, for instance. You know, you can, you can define the profit any way you want. So that's really where you get the flexibility to really design an incentive plan All right, good. that's gonna meet your goals. Yeah, okay, so not only can it, can it help to, of course, in, increase um, uh, profitability, but also, it can serve to retain key employees as well as attract. It, yeah, and I, you know, I think, and we've, we've seen this with the clients we work with, you know, certain industries, it's hard, and it, CPAs are classic examples. I mean, it is hard to attract and retain employees, um, especially if you're, you know, like our size and, and below. Um, so anything you can do to give, to reward the right people, make them feel like owners, make them feel, feel like they have a, a stake in the company, that's going to help you retrain, retain and attract people. And that's more important than ever in this current environment. I mean, you know, there's a lot of unemployment and stuff related to COVID, but at the same time, you know, a lot of, a lot of businesses require people with special skills and there's a shortage of those. So you really have to be thinking about it aggressively and smartly if you're, you know, going to be successful. Yeah. Okay. So, anything else that we should talk about before we wrap up? <clears throat> no, I think um, you and I have done an incredible job of describing <laughs> every possible detail, and I don't know why we bother having guests. <laughs> yeah. 
I know. Why do we do that? Uh, okay, wait a minute. Here's a question. What professionals are needed in order to, to implement a profits interest plan? You definitely, I mean, from a paperwork standpoint, you need an attorney for a couple of reasons. They need to make sure your partnership agreement is laying out exactly how this person is going to be treated. And then you'll have, I don't, it's probably an addendum to your partnership agreement. It may be a, a separate document that's going to lay out exactly the details of the profit interest itself. And then you're going to want someone like, like yourself to help them figure out what incentives are we trying to accomplish? What, you know, what, what are our financial goals that we're trying to accomplish? And what's the best way to incentivize people to help us get there? <clears throat> Well, and isn't a CPA going to be helpful? Well, yeah, I mean, the CPA is going to be helpful in the sense that you want to make sure it's structured properly so that you're getting the tax implications that, that you want. And you want to be able to explain to the recipient, here's how your life is going to change from a tax standpoint. Yes, definitely. All right, good. Well done. Yeah. Um, okay, folks. So if you want help with this, contact Walter at 301 951 nine zero nine zero and uh, if you need help to think through how to maximize the value of your business or to plan for it you can contact me at 301-859-0860 and again walter at 951-9090 and um, you can you can access resources at exitreadiness.com grfcpa.com and nslp.com Thank you for listening. If you've benefited from today, uh, please consider sharing us on social media. Until the next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Pat Ennis and Walter Dial signing off. Thank you.